Bonjour. Good evening, good evening. Thank you to an, another episode of The Unexpected Detour, where in life detours are inevitable. I'm your host, Francis Hammond. And today I have my special guest is Reverend Dwayne Graham. Reverend Dwayne Graham is like a brother to me. He's a coach, but most importantly, he's a husband, a father, he's a pastor of GCC, which is Gospel Cultural Center, which you can see online every Sunday. He has Bible study and Fridays, you can meet them in person in White Plains at the church. I don't know the name of the church, but we will let him give you that information. I chose Dr. Well, we're going to call him Dr. because he's going to be a doctor. So I chose Dr. Dwayne Graham to be here because so many people don't understand that they have to live in the street and not know how to get out of there. So he's going to tell his story from the street to the jail, to the pulpit, take over the floor, <laughs> Reverend Graham. First, let me say thank you for having me on, on your podcast. Um, I just want to pray that God continues to bless you and your podcast with so many people who have uh, powerful stories, powerful testimonies that need to be heard. Um, so shout out to you, Francis, for giving people who may not be a part of the cliques and crews, <laughs> who are not part of some of these big name uh, 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 brands who don't get an opportunity to tell their story. So shout out to you and may God bless you with so many more people to, to interview and partner with to grow Thank the vision you. that God has given to you. Thank now, you. as far as myself, um, thank you for that introduction. I am uh, a husband. I am a father. I am called to this ministry to teach and preach and live out this gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm currently the lead pastor of Gospel Cultural Center, where we have services on Zoom every Sunday. We have Bible study, which is what we call Scriptures for the Future every Tuesday at 7 p.m. on Zoom. Um, and now we have just partnered with Mount Hope, AME Zion Church, AME Church in White Plains, New York, with my sister, Reverend Whitney Smith, where we will be having uh, in-person services once a month, once a month on Fridays at 7 p.m. We actually are having our Night of Becoming service. That is the theme for each month. It is a Night of Becoming. We're here at Gospel Cultural Center. We are helping people become who God called and created them to be and help them identify what their gifts are for those who may not know what their gifts are um, so they can do what it is that God created them for. And then teaching people how to have what God wants for them rather than so many of us wanting what we want that may not be what God wants for us. So that's what we'll be doing on Fridays. And that's a lot of the teaching that we do here at Gospel Culture Center teaching people how to become, teaching people how to tell God yes, helping people who struggle with keeping their yes to God um, on what we like to say at Gospel Culture Center, on the table, because sometimes life tries to get us to take our yes back and tell God no and take our will back and try to figure it out on our own without God. So that's some of the stuff that we're doing here at Gospel Culture Center and what I've been called and chosen to do. But how did I get here? How did I get to this place coming from a, a past that is, uh, 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 I'm just grateful to be uh, uh, transformed and still transform me from a past that, that all started with, God bless the dead, my parents who had transitioned, my mom and my dad who gave birth to their four children. My oldest brother's name is Donald, uh, my brother who passed away five days after my birthday, five days after my birthday, when I had turned 40 years old, his name is Derek. He transitioned myself, which is Dwayne, and my sister Dawn. Um, they gave birth to four children, and we had a pretty good, pretty good childhood. We went to Catholic school um, for my first four years. My oldest brother is maybe his first nine years because I know he went to high school. But all the way up to ninth grade, he went to Catholic school, um, and then we went to public school because tuition was a bit much for my mom and my dad. Um, and then from Catholic school to public school. Um, my dad, he went through some challenges. Uh, addiction showed up because my dad was a, 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 a Vietnam veteran and 
he went through some things in Nam as well as his childhood. And once my dad transitioned when I was 15 years old, which was 1994, Francis, that's when I didn't know how to process a lot of my hurt and a lot of my feelings. So at 15, I felt hurt. I felt abandoned. I felt angry um, because my dad is no longer here. So I was doing pretty well as far as school was concerned. I had some great aspirations, some great dreams that I had at that early stage of my life. Um, but I ended up in the streets, not necessarily homeless, but streets in terms of the lifestyle um, because I dropped out of school. I was so angry with my with, 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 with my dad because I felt like he left me and I just didn't know how to process those feelings. So I became very self-destructive. I became a, a person who sabotaged himself early on. And as a result, I, I, I dropped out of school and I ended up being in the streets and I started selling drugs to my community. I ended up doing what was done to me. Right. I, I sold drugs to my own people, which is what was done to my dad because he passed away from the disease of addiction. Um, he used crack cocaine and he passed away from HIV and AIDS. And I ended up doing what was done to my family. And that's how some of my story starts as far as how we're titling this, this, this interview and this conversation from the streets. That's some of my street experience and how I ended up starting to sell drugs. I dropped out of school because I didn't know how to process my feelings as a young 15 year old whose father just passed away, whose father was actively involved in his life, but his addiction played a huge role in why he was unable to continue to be as the stern, authoritative, present, active, involved, engaged dad that he was in my life. So that's how my story with the streets began. So I'll, I'll, stay, I'll, I'll pause there and let you ask whatever question that you have. Have and after the street, but you know, usually that is what happens. You're mm -hmm. in the street and you we're selling drugs to our own people. We're killing them. Yes. And and it's uh and I understand you're 15, so you felt abandoned. So this was your way of retribution. You're gonna sell drugs back to those same people that did it to your father. Retribution, and you did what you did, but did you get caught? <laughs> did I get caught? Yes, I did get caught. I got caught. And um, and here's what I like to share with people. Um, even though my reasoning for doing it was not because it was done to me, my reason for going to the streets was um, finances, right? My, here's a mother now who has to go on, a wife who's now a widow now who has to go on, taking care of four children, you know, off of one income. Um, so, you know, with paying a rent of uh, a four bedroom from my apartment, you know, in the early 90s. So, you know, just wrap your mind around some of, you know, that right there, some context of how overwhelming that is to deal with the loss of your husband, to now be left with four children and have to take care of them and your living situation. So there was times when, you know, it wasn't that we wasn't sustained and she didn't maintain and take care of us. It was the pressure of being a 15-year-old, now a 16-year-old, now a 17-year-old, now, 18 year old who's now dealing with um, just not being able to have the things that I wanted. So I resorted to the streets to try to get some of the things that I wanted, which was very materialistic. Just clothes mm -hmm. and shopping and just want to have money. What in the, my that's what the streets does. Right. It's fast, so, fast money. So a lot of my, if not all of my decision making in terms of uh, going to the streets, it wasn't so much to do what was done to me. But at the same time, being honest with myself and taking accountability, I ended up doing what was done to me. But it wasn't the reason why I yeah, did it. It wasn't done intentionally. It's yeah, I didn't that, do it because yeah. to get back. I just was, you know, financially, I, 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 was, I was dealing with so much pressure at that time of my life. And then the building that I lived in played a huge role in terms of influencing that kind of lifestyle that I once chose. There was brothers that was selling drugs out of my building and, you know, they was making anywhere from half a million dollars to a million dollars, maybe quarterly, uh, so maybe even sometimes <laughs> once a year. You know, I don't know. You know, I wasn't getting money with them, but they was making a lot of money. So just coming out of a building, living in a building that people are doing these kind of things, it played a huge role in terms of like I, I got to get this money too. <laughs> I want to get some of this money. You weren't scared. 
Um, at that time, I think that I was so not. I think I know that I was so. Um, I was so hurt, Francis. I was so. I became so angry that that oh. that combination doesn't allow you to be afraid. Oh, okay. Hurt, anger, and abandonment does not allow us. Um, for me, it didn't allow me to be fearful. I, I was I was actually fearless. I really cared less um, with that combination. I didn't know that at the time because I was still young. But looking right. back, you know, I, I don't mind having conversations with whether teens or maybe even adults who may not have been able to make the connection in terms of what emotions that they may have felt from whatever experiences that they went through and that they dealt with in the connection of what those emotions and the space that it put them in, the choices that they've made um, and who they ended up becoming. And now the consequences that they have had to live with. And some people are still not healed from a lot of the choices that they made because shame and guilt. So for myself, um, in terms of did I get caught? Yes, I did. And I, I'm thankful for getting caught because I've had some experiences where I could have lost my life in the streets. I've had guns drawn on me. I've had police pull guns out on me. I've had officers kick me. I've had officers drag me, mm -hmm. slap me. I've had my fair share of experiences with police when I look at some of the things that have happened to some of our black and brown brothers and sisters when they have had their encounters with law enforcement. They didn't, they're not here no more. So I'm grateful that I did get caught and I did get arrested and I was sentenced to five years to life in prison because I got caught under what they call uh, the, uh, 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 oh my God, it's escaping me, the Rockefeller drug law. I got caught underneath the Rockefeller drug law where if you sell two or more ounces of cocaine, um, you can be sentenced to a minimum of three years to life in prison. I had sold more than two or more ounces of cocaine and I ended up going back and forth to court trying to get less time and ended up getting <laughs> the most time. So I ended up getting sentenced to five years to life in prison. And I tell people as, 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 uh, as lengthy as that sounds and actually is, it's one of the best things that ever happened to me. Did you take advantage of all the uh, education they offered there? Well, I will say, yes, I did, because I ended up getting my GED while I was in prison. Okay. Um, that's when I got introduced to me having this gift that some of the brothers that I was incarcerated with kind of like made me aware of that I did not know I possessed, which was this 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 impact, this ability to have influence, to teach, to counsel. So I ended up uh, teaching what they call an ART program, which is uh, alternative to violence. It's an anger management program, rather. Um, and I was in the, I was in prison teaching this program, and that's when I started to develop this gift of teaching and and counseling. Uh, uh, of people who did not know how to process their emotions, such as myself at one time. So you getting do caught- do a good job from, at it too. Thank you, Francis. <laughs> <laughs> right, so getting, getting caught was one of the best things that ever happened to me because I could have got killed with certain things that I was involved in when I was in the street. Again, as a result of not knowing how to process my hurt and my, and my pain and my just abandonment and, and just anger that I felt from losing my father at the age of 15. So that's how we ended up in the streets. And this is how we ended up in prison. I ended up in prison because I got caught selling two or more ounces to an undercover cop who I did not even know. We was under investigation for 11 months. I did not know wow. I was being watched for 11 months. And they came and caught me and arrested me. And I had to do five years to life in prison. Wow. That's sad. I mean, it's not sad, but it did save you because now look where you are. To God be the glory. Yeah. And then what made you want to be a, a, a pastor? Well, I didn't ask for this. <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't ask for this one, Francis. I didn't ask for this one at all. Um, I, even in, on Sunday, I preached a message um, titled uh, Required to Become um, and transitioning into better re required to become. And yeah, I thought, I'm going to go back and listen to it on uh, YouTube. I checked, uh, I was in the book of Luke um, and I was reading chapter 12 verses 47 and 48 and, 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 and Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's basically paraphrased, right? But it's, it's the language within the text or depending on the translation that you read from, uh, to whom much is given, much is required. 
Um, so I was sharing in the message that I was I was chosen for this, right? I was chosen for this calling. I didn't ask for this call, right? But I was I was running from this call and I was I was ducking and dodging, so I thought I was. God calling me into He was chasing right behind me, wasn't this 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 mm -hmm. life, um, this this purpose, this purposeful life. Um, so this is how I ended up being or becoming um this 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 what I like to call this servant leader, this servant leader, a person who serves and who doesn't mind uh being anointed by God to lead those who he sends to me to serve. So I actually I actually appreciate that title. Not that I got a problem with the title pastor, um, but I'm not really pressed by titles. So I, I'm, I'm a servant at, 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 at the end of the day. So I was saved to serve. Yeah, what I like about you is you go back to your neighborhood and you reach out to them in a godly way. Yeah. And it's like you're fishing. You know, you're like the fishermen and they're drawn to you because they see what has happened to you that their life can be turned around too. And it's it, it's a positive thing that you don't always have to remain in the street. You could transform your life and you can be a better person. Yeah. And that I that's what I used to tell you. I said, Dwayne, you should go on Harlem to break down there <laughs> because you can relate to them to you know the people down there mm. because they need somebody they can relate to you know they don't want no highfalutin person they want somebody that is on that same level who can talk to them on the same level and they've been down that road before mm. yeah yeah and that's what i like about you because you've been down that road and i know you you reach out to children as well yes because, yes yeah we are currently um my sister once again Reverend Whitney Smith, her and I, we have written uh, two books. Our first book being called, or titled rather, uh, uh, Meeting the Authentic You. Um, it is a, a meditational, uh, inspirational, devotional, uh, kind of along the lines of self-help. But that was our first book that we wrote together. And then our second book that we wrote together was called Don't Drop Out On You, right? So Meeting the Authentic You and then Don't Drop Out On You, which is another meditational a transformational meditation um, where we kind of give you our, uh, 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 um, our testimonies, our experiences um, of things that we've experienced and how we were able to overcome these things. So we pretty much wrote these two particular books as intergenerational books, right? Where adults, seniors, or even youth can be able to really read it and understand it where it's not just specifically for one particular group, it's intergenerational, but in this season right here, friends, we've been actually focused now on trying to get our book inside of schools to work with the children to help them with our second book not drop out because there's there's a lot, there's so much going on. Um, and we're trying to the best of our ability to reach them, to serve them, to have a conversation with the youth um, about not dropping out and not just dropping out in school. But drop it out on themselves, drop it out nice. on life. Because again, her and I, we, we went through some very, very tough times at 13, 14, 15, 16, um, the ages that a lot of our youth are experiencing. And we want to share our story with them in hopes that it encourages them not to drop out or make some of the choices that we've made at that age. Because again, some people are not fortunate enough to have a testimony after they make a certain choice. Some right. choices, some people are still having a hard time living with. And there's some people who have made some choices. And unfortunately, they're no longer here because of the choice that they've made. So yes. we're trying to reach as many youth as possible by going inside of schools and getting the opportunity to, 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 to let them know that there's somebody who really does understand how they feel. Let them know that there's somebody else that they can talk to. Um, so, yes, that's, that's, that's what we're doing as far as the youth is concerned. We actually have, by the grace of God, this will be our third school uh, with, well, our sec, this will be our third, this will be our third time since last year and now this year being able to go inside of the school. But we've been going inside of schools for the last seven or eight years um, with our books, trying our best to help just have conversations with the youth 
um, to, to, to show them something other than what they may be looking at and dealing with. Um, so yes, that's, that's, that's what's going on as far as the youth is concerned. Using yeah, our that's, that's awesome because they need help. They need yeah. help. They're really lost out here. Really um, lost. Yeah. Just I overwhelmed. See. Just overwhelmed. Overwhelmed and just not knowing. Um, you know what it is? Sometimes how, the parents, they want to be friends with the kids and that, 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 that doesn't work. You got to be a parent too. I mean, you sometimes know? I understand that because some parents who, who, who try that approach, Francis, they try being a parent is, is what idealistically we should do and be. But there's parents who don't know what's going on with their children because yeah. of the parent role. There's, there's parents now who take the approach of friendship and there's nothing that the kid doesn't feel, you know, apprehensive to share, right? So I'm not saying that it's right or wrong. I'm just saying to understand why parents who choose the friendship role and route. No, the, the friendship part I get. It's the part where they're friends and they want to hang out or dress like them. Those are the parents <laughs> I'm talking about. Bro. I've seen them. No, the ones... I mean, my mother was, she always let me know she was my best friend. Mm -hmm. So anything I needed, I can go to her and tell. But you know, as you grow up, you meet your own peers. So you're not going to go and tell your parents, you know, you will still, you are, you got peers now, you're talking to them. You know? <laughs> yeah, if you want to do stuff, you're not going to tell your mother. You know, uh -uh. Well, you know, but, we, live in, we live in a different time now, friends. It's a different day and age now. Yeah. Very I'm not different. saying that, I'm not. I'm saying that this age is right and that age is wrong, or that age was right and this age is wrong. I'm just, it's these are some very, very different times that we are in. Things yeah. that we've never probably thought that we would see or you experience. You know what? To honest, be honest, it's as though the revelations are coming to pass. I'll be honest with you. And I think that's, that that's how I see things. And, and I agree with you, right? I don't disagree, but I think that's. That that we are spooked by the revelation more than we are seeking God to get wisdom on how to deal with the revelation. That's mm -hmm. what I'm thinking. That's my hope. That's my prayer. That God is raising up a, 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 a community of believers who know how to respond to some of these revelations that is scaring people out of not knowing what to do. Well, it doesn't scare me because it, it is what it is, you know. Well, most people are scared. Right? Yeah, you I may. know. Well, most people are afraid, right? You know why? Because they have no relationship with the one. Well, they some don't... people who do got relationship are scared. True, but you got to, you know, it, it's hard for me. I mean, for me, it was hard to learn to trust him. And I know a lot of people, they've been church, church, churched, but they don't trust. Mm -hmm. You know, and I and I know that because when I went through cancer, that's when I learned to trust. Now mm -hmm. I've been going to church all my life, told to trust, but it was that one episode that I learned to trust. You know, it was like he put the fire underneath me, and it's like mm -hmm. you're gonna learn to trust. So to God, to God yeah. be the glory. And that's no. how I started to learn. To trust and try to tell people, you know, you gotta trust. And plus, you help me too. <laughs> I forget those coach. Yeah, Dwayne coached me, everybody, and they were awesome. So if you so need a coach, you gotta make an appointment. And <laughs> if his schedule is open, you'll get it. And I'm telling you, you won't be sorry. You will. You'll be happy when you leave. You'll be refreshed, renewed. Because that's how I felt. Yeah. Yeah, I felt renewed. Every time I left, I was like, gee, I was like, I should have did an hour. <laughs> no, did I, I did do an hour. I said like, I should have did two did hours. Two hours. Two yeah, hours. I should have did two hours. That's the minimum is an hour. If the minimum is right, an hour. Right, I did the hour. I said I should have did longer. This was getting good because it was like, <laughs> oh, man, we got to go already. Yes, but they were they were good sessions. Hmm. So, Thank And you. I've never forgotten them and they're ingrained up here. Thank you so much, Francis. Yes. So thank, you for trust, thank you for trusting the God in me. Yes, there was the God in you. We had some nice intimate conversations. So, so anybody looking for a, a coach, 
There you go. That's him. He doesn't <laughs> tell you secrets. Trust me, he keeps them there. But Dwayne does have a book, and this is the book. Amen. 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 Yes. Amen. When God becomes enough, he got his Amen. book. Yeah, I got mine here. It's a daily a daily devotional. You might want to pick it up yes. and read it every day. Because I know some people, you read that daily word, but this is not the daily word. This is a different way of making you aware of God and you and your relationship. Mm. You'll see things a little bit different. Sometimes we need to see things different. You know, we got to get out of the old way and get into a new way. So I'm going to show you this book. I'll put it in the end and you can uh, purchase it. They could still get it on Amazon, right? Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Okay, you heard it. Amazon and Barnes and Nobles. So you got no excuses, people. <laughs> yes, but I thank you for your time and you, taking the time out of your busy schedule. So, but when we get off, could you just send me all the information so I can let the people know, you know, how they can contact you for coaching. Absolutely, absolutely. How they can um, attend? Yeah, G I have the link for GCC. Yes, we do. Zoom. Yeah, I have mm -hmm. that. I have this book, so I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> and the other two books. Yes, when God yeah. uh, uh, don't drop out on you. Um, and that really was that first <laughs> book because I I just deleted a video when you went to the school and you had that book and those <laughs> kids was intrigued they were listening they were like i said see mm -hmm. yeah. yeah uh so i def i'll definitely uh send you that information francis but i thank you so much for uh, God, thank just sharing you. just sharing sharing um now, i thank you for well, sharing your story because on friday you're going to hear a story somewhat similar to yours hmm. but worse <laughs> okay <laughs> yes, they were supposed to be yesterday, but but you're gonna hear that. So mm -hmm. okay, okay, okay. Yeah. But, and hopefully, uh, yeah. you guys could um kind of link up because he has a podcast and he was incarcerated mm -hmm. for twenty five years, twenty seven years. Okay. Yeah. So I'm gonna do him Friday, and we're gonna see. We'll take it from there. Okay. Well, again, I want to say thank you for sharing, sharing, right? Because what I love to share, uh, there's this scene where uh, Peter's in the boat with the disciples real quickly. I'm not going to be long. No, right? I, have, I got time. Don't worry. Jesus, Jesus is, you know, he's out, you know, in the water. And he says, Lord, is that you? Because you tell me to come. And he says, come on. Right. So Peter gets out of the boat. He starts walking on water towards Jesus. And I'm saying thank you to you because that scene for me, even though it's been taught and preached about Peter getting out of the boat and walking on water and even Jesus being out on the water. Um, but what I like, what God revealed to me from just an interpretation was that Jesus shared the water with him. Jesus wasn't like, yo, just, just no, don't come out here. Y'all look at me while I'm walking on water and y'all stay in the boat. So I'm saying thank you for sharing right? Your, your podcast with me, right? Thank you for sharing the water with me because sometimes people don't share the water. People mm -hmm. want to just be seen. They want you to look at them while they're doing what they're doing and they don't want to share the water. So thank you, Francis, for sharing well, Thank the you water. for being here. Well, that's why I said everybody has a detour and you went from one place to another place to get to that destination. Yes. Whether it's a good place or a bad place, we all have these detours that, but nobody hears how these this person really got there. You know, mm -hmm. you're like, oh, you're a preacher, but how did you get there? I mean, you know, you're they always look at preachers as, oh, they was raised in the church and this and that, they don't fall. But I wanted you to tell your story to let them know they're not all churched up. No, they not come at all. from some place. Not at all. I gave my life, Francis, to the Lord while I was in prison doing five years to life. Oh, there was one that. gentleman that I met when I first got in, when I first got upstate. I got to share this story in terms of how 
I, I, I want for somebody who may want the backdrop, like I, I need more context. I need more story. I need more of the particulars. How did you become this, this servant leader, pastor of this gospel culture center? Well, for me, I met this gentleman while I was in prison and he professed to have a lot of money. So because I'm not saved, I'm not religious, I don't got no relationship with God or the Lord, and I just got up north from prison, I'm still in hustler mode. I'm still, I got to get this money, even though I'm in jail. So I tried to befriend him because he presented himself as a person who had money, even though we both was in prison. So we talked a few days, even though I just met him. And then one day he said to me, I want you to uh, go to the law library and reopen your case. Because I want you to give that time that they sentenced you back. They sentenced you to too much time. Now, I knew I was guilty. So it didn't make sense for me to go reopen this case and then try to go fight this case. And if I'm convicted of what I know I did do, I can get 15 years to life now. I didn't want to go through that. So he said to me, if you don't do that, don't talk to me no more. I said to him, you don't believe in God? He said, which one? There's so many of them. Now, because I'm not religious, I'm not educated, I'm not mindful. Here I am, Francis, a 20-year-old young adult who just got up now up, upstate to prison, not as knowledgeable as I am now about Christianity, Islam, Hindu, Buddha, right? Catholic, seven-day event, all these different ways, right? All these different beliefs of, of, of that people have of God. I didn't have none of them. I just said, do you believe? And he said, yeah, but which one? And I didn't have an answer for him. So I just said, God. Now, mind you, another brother who I just met had gave me a book. And the name of the book, it was like a Christian book, which I really didn't understand what I was reading. But the title of this book, Francis, was What Must I Do to Be Saved? You know what? I remember that book. Those those tracks they used to yes. give out. Yes. Yes. I probably still have some from my mother right here. So, so I'm reading this book at nighttime, not really understanding what I'm reading. Mind you, I shared with you that I had this anger and this hurt towards my dad for passing away. So when I'm reading, trying to understand what I'm reading, mind you, I got a fifth grade reading level at this time because I dropped out of school. It says, when the son of man shall return, when I see the son of man, I'm thinking not about Jesus. I'm thinking about my father, that mm -hmm. my biological father is going to return to me. So some of my early immature understanding and developing faith with reading this booklet that I don't understand. And I'm thinking that this book is telling me that my biological father is going to return to me. This conversation that I'm having with this gentleman during the day. And he says, if you don't go reopen your case, don't talk to me no more. In that moment, I made a decision that I didn't know would change my life. The decision that I made was never mind the money that, I, that I'm trying to get and befriending him. Here's where I now trust God. The first time in my life where I could say that I trust God spiritually was saying, well, okay, well, I ain't going to talk to you no more. That night, that night, it was a cold winter night, and it was snowing. It was like a blizzard. I tell, if I'm, I'm not lying, I, I want to say it, but my wife hate when I say it. Hate, hate when I say I'm not going to say it. But if I'm lying, God, you have your way. I woke up in the middle of, of the night, and I was the only one that was up. I'm in a dorm area, it's a dormitory of 60 of us in a the dorm. There was a strong wind that woke me, that woke me up. And when I looked out the window, it was like, like uh, gates or, or like th to protect the windows. And the window that I was all kind of by, it, it, the, the guard or the gate broke off. And in that moment, I knew that there was something spiritual and godly that happened. 
And my mind immediately went to me telling the God, do you trust God? Do you believe God? So it was in that moment that I believed spiritually, God just look at my son. And then there was a series of events after that where I met some brothers while I was in prison who was like, yo, man, you should come with us to church. And I was like, yo, I wasn't going to church in New York. I'm not going to start now. I'll wait till I go home to go to church. I'm not going to be a phony. And they said, nah, it starts here. You need to come in here. So I ended up going with the brothers. And I went, and I went, and I went. And there was a chaplain there in Green Correctional Facility in 1999. His name was Joseph Priss. He was the chaplain. He was the pastor of the, of the jail, chaplain of the jail, of the prison. And he would always call me out, friends. He would say, Brother Graham, come here. Come pray in front of everybody. And I used to get an attitude. Why is this man calling me? Why he keep asking me to pray? And he would say, you got a huge calling on your life. I didn't know what he was talking about. I didn't even know what he meant. But I would pray sometimes with anger and frustration. Because like, why you? I felt singled out, not knowing that God was using him to develop me. So in terms of people who may think that certain people who are pastors or reverend, whatever the case may be, no, I didn't grow up in the church going home. I, my experience started in prison. God used prison to get me to this way, this this version of myself, to this life. Um, and now I'm just grateful that he didn't allow me to be killed while I was in the street living that lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And that he know he knew what to use to get me to be who I am and who I'm still becoming for the kingdom of God. So that's just my story in terms of how mine started. He used a man who portrayed to have a lot of money, but we was in jail together. And not that people who are in jail don't got no money, but there's, there's rich people or wealthy people who are in, who are in prison, right? Um, but I had a moment for the first time in my life where my question saved my life. Do you believe God? My question saved me. Because if I was so fixated on wanting to be connected to him and never ask that question, I probably would have allowed his influence to make me go give my stuff, go back, reopen my case, and get more time, and only God knows what would have happened to me. And that probably was a question out of innocence. Do you believe God? It really was. It wasn't and out of conviction. No, it you were just asking him a question. Yeah. And he couldn't answer you. No? He did. He yeah. answered me. He just said, which one? Yeah, he know too many. <laughs> <laughs> but if you know that track, I believe I still have them from my mother. What yeah. must I do to be saved? Because I remember she used to be in the street giving them out. And, yeah. Yeah, that, like, the, okay. That 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 gentleman, that moment, that question, that track or that book set the stage for how I got here. For greater things to come. Along Not with, along with, I, I can't, I can't, I can't leave this out. Along with a, a, a woman that I used to deal with at that time, who, when I went to prison, she wrote me a letter, Francis. It was, it was a 22 page front and back. So it was really 44 pages. And she told me in this letter, a bunch of different things. But when I was in the street, what she told me was when you used to be in the street, I used to be in your room. This was my girlfriend at the time. I used to be in your room praying for you while you was outside of the street. Wow. When you would come home and you would be high or for smoking weed and drinking. I used to pray over you. Wow. Asking God to save you. My prison experience, what I just shared, and that woman right there plays a huge role in why I am where I am. You had somebody praying for you and you all the time. I didn't know that she was doing that for me. I and never she let you know that she prayed for you. I was I never knew. I used to come in the room, she used to be playing gospel music. I would turn it off and put on some Tupac or Wu-Tang or Biggie Smalls. <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to hear that. You know what I'm saying? I I, I didn't. I wasn't this. I'm saying all this to say, but I, I didn't come from that church going. Family. Right. You were in my church. Parents, my, my parents were big on education. Okay. My mother was trying to find her way spiritually. She would go to church, but she, they, they, we wasn't forced to go to church. We right. weren't forced to pray with one another or for each other. But they were right. big on education. They, they taught us the value of education. 
Right. And that's why the religion part didn't play into it because it was the education. And I'm so glad that it didn't, even though we started out going to Catholic school. Yeah, I'm going to ask you, they didn't teach you religion in Catholic school? Well, it was interesting because I went to Catholic school my first four years. Okay. And I don't know if my mother put down that we were Catholic or that we weren't Catholic, but I just know that I didn't feel a part of when it was communion time because I never got communion. Oh, because you didn't make your confirmation and your communion. You had to do all that stuff to do that. So maybe she didn't do that. And that's the reason why I didn't experience that or feel a part yeah. of that. So for me growing up. She probably up, didn't want you to take part in the sacraments that they do. Probably not. I don't know. I never had that conversation with my mom. And, <laughs> Trust and maybe me, I your could've. mother, she knew what she was talking about. That. So so, yeah. so I, I, I've had my own. I don't want to say issues like being negative towards religion and, and tradition. Um, but my experience, I didn't feel a part of. Okay. So I now, in my relationship with God, always try to make people feel loved and a part of. Right. And that you do. Whenever I come to your house, I feel loved. All the time. To God be the glory. Yes. All right. Well, that will conclude. This episode of the Unexpected Detour, Dwayne, I, oh, well, Reverend Dwayne Graham, <laughs> I do appreciate you spending this time with us Thank and you, telling your story, and I hope we can do it again. Absolutely. Thank you for okay. having me. It was a joy. And I, let's continue to yes. become, yes. even when we get detour. Exactly. All those detours, yes. <laughs>